do two things. He was shocked by the courage in, of the Ukrainian people and the tenacity of their resistance. And he was shocked by how effectively President Biden and you and this administration put together this broad international coalition, Germany, Switzerland, Finland, Sweden. This past weekend's announcements by the G7 to further limit dependence on Russian, Russian energy will bite even harder. In the months to come, we must sustain and expand our efforts to help Ukraine, including intensified sanctions, export controls, and other means of ratcheting up economic pressure on Russia. Financial stability allows Americans to trust their money is safe in the bank. It means they can get an affordable mortgage without fear that they'll lose their home. It means they can count on their retirement savings knowing the investments won't be gambled away by reckless speculators. It means taxpayers are not forced to shell out billions to bail out the banks that gamble with our whole economy. It's why Congress created FSOC in the Dodd-Frank Wall Street reform bill. Americans are still living with the consequences from the last time Wall Street took too many risks. Families who lost their homes after 2008 still haven't recovered all the wealth the crisis seized from them. Whenever big banks or hedge funds come up with some new scheme that goes wrong, they're never the ones that pay the price. It's ordinary Americans whose homes and retirement savings and like livelihoods are at risk. And it's taxpayers. People in this town act like they've forgotten the bailouts. In too many cases, they probably have. Americans haven't forgotten when families already struggling with lost jobs, lost homes, lost savings, are forced to use their tax money to bail out some of the richest elites in this country. That stays with most people. We created the watchdog to make sure it never happens again. Under the Biden administration and the Secretary Yellen's leadership, we once again have an FSOC that looks out for those risks to our financial system. They've turned the page on the prior administration's Wall Street first mentality. The last White House, always looking out for its corporate allies, did everything in its power to stop this agency from doing its job. They ignored shadow banks that grew in size and created risks in the system. They gutted the agency from the inside out, diminishing career public servants dedicated to protecting our economy. They abandoned their responsibilities. They did nothing to identify, nothing to address risk to financial stability. So when the global coronavirus pandemic froze our financial markets, Big and small companies weren't prepared to withstand the shock. Our government had to step in to prevent a market meltdown and stabilize the economy. What we've seen over the past two years is that risk can come at any time in any form. FSOC keeps watch on all the potential risks to our economy so working families don't have to. These public servants look at ways to improve financial system resilience in the face of climate-related financial risks. Their job is to make sure our markets are efficient and fair. We've seen market frenzies like GameStop and hedge fund blowups like Archegos. Those have the potential to cause dangerous volatility, and FSOC is watching out for asset bubbles so that risky, ass risky bets that go bad don't actually hurt the real economy. This watchdog works with financial institutions to shore up cyber defenses and protect our, protect our financial system from cyber attacks. They're tackling risk posed by cryptocurrency and digital assets. So many Americans search for an alternative to Wall Street that has burned them time and again, but we can't allow them to be left holding the bag when an inevitable crash uh, or hack comes. FSOC monitors international risks. They're clear-eyed about the threats to the U.S. and the global economy, a pandemic, a broken supply chain, Putin's attack on Russia, finally the, or on, on Ukraine. Finally, the agency is doing its job again, working to prevent corporate greed and overledged deals and risky bets on Wall Street from crashing our financial system as interest rates rise. For the first time in decades, workers are seeing real wage gains and more bargaining power. Median wages for the lowest income workers increased last year, an average of 6%. The unemployment rate is 3.6%, the lowest in five decades. For many Americans, those gains don't go as far when you're paying more at the gas pump and grocery store. Corporations blame workers. They claim they just have to raise prices to keep up with costs. Of course, they don't have to raise prices to keep making a profit. They could cut their own executive bonuses. They could do fewer stock buybacks and still enjoy healthy profits. But instead, they'd rather price gouge working families. Don't take it from me. Listen to the CEOs who brag. It, it, stockholder meetings brag about their enormous pricing power every quarter on, on investor calls. When big corporations have concentrated, and on investor calls, when big corporations have concentrated power and no competition, the usual, usual rules of capitalism don't rein them in. 
This Wall Street business model incentivizes anything that juices stock prices, including excessive risk taking at the expense of long term stability and broad economic growth. We need to build and maintain a resilient financial system with strong safeguards in place at the biggest Wall Street firms so they can withstand economic shock without wrecking the real economy. That's FSOC's job, to serve as the Wall Street watchdog looking out for working Americans on Main Street. At this critical moment, FSOC's job is more important than ever. Secretary Yellen, I look forward to your testimony. Senator Toomey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Yellen. Welcome back to the committee. Today's hearing is an important opportunity to discuss FSOC's 2021 annual report and other matters. I've long been skeptical about FSOC's process for designating non-bank financial institutions as systemically important, or SIFIs. FSOC's process has been opaque, and previous designations have lacked sufficient cost-benefit analysis. This approach also needlessly imposed bank-like regulations on non-bank financial institutions, such as insurance companies and asset managers. But more fundamentally, the act of designating a firm as a non-bank SIFI signals to the market that the firm is too big to fail and would be bailed out if it became insolvent, thereby introducing moral hazard. For these reasons, I was glad to see FSOC in 2019 unanimously approved an activities-based approach to identify and assess potential risk, as well as an enhanced cost-benefit analysis for potential designations. These changes marked significant improvements over the previous approach with respect to both process and substance. I've been encouraged that you've recognized the value of this approach, and I urge FSOC to retain it going forward. I've also been concerned that FSOC, like other financial regulators, is becoming politicized. Consider global warming. FSOC has held 10 meetings under your leadership, and seven of those meetings have focused on global warming, according to the public readouts. By contrast, not a single one of those meetings included a discussion of cybersecurity, which clearly presents a much more imminent and significant threat to the financial system. In October of last year, FSOC issued a lengthy report that audaciously acclaimed global warming is an, quote, emerging threat to the financial stability of the United States, end quote. And FSOC uses this supposed risk to justify its recommendation that financial regulators consider sweeping changes to their rules. But the actual data shows that physical risks associated with global warming, that is to say severe weather events, do not threaten financial stability. Economic damage from weather-related events as a percentage of GDP has actually trended down steadily over the last 30 years. And we're not aware of a single bank failure in the modern era caused by any weather event. As I have previously warned, the real risk is political. Some unelected financial regulators want to accelerate our transition to a lower carbon economy, and they want to misuse their powers to allocate capital away from traditional energy companies to do it. At a time of skyrocketing energy prices, we certainly don't need financial regulators making it even more expensive for Americans to fill up their gas tanks or heat their homes. Addressing global warming requires difficult political decisions that involve trade-offs. And in a democratic society, these trade-offs must be made by elected representatives accountable to the American people through a transparent and deliberative legislative process. Instead of pursuing political issues that are outside the mandate and expertise of financial regulators, the FSOC should enhance coordination across regulators on existing threats to the financial system. To this end, I was encouraged that the FSOC annual report identified certain issues that are worthy of regulatory attention, such as enhancing, enhancing the resilience of the U.S. Treasury market and improving the cybersecurity resilience of the financial sector. But I do worry that progress on addressing these challenges could be stalled because of FSOC's focus on political issues. Finally, in your role as chair of the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, or PWG, you released a report last November on stablecoins. Although I disagree with the report's recommendation that all stablecoin issuers must be insured depository institutions, I was glad to see it acknowledged that it is the responsibility of Congress to create new rules for stablecoins. Last month, I released a discussion draft of a bill the Stablecoin Trust Act, to establish a regulatory framework for stable coins. There are tremendous potential benefits of stable coins in our society. Today, stable coins primarily facilitate trading of digital assets, but tomorrow, stable coins could be widely used in the physical economy for payments and automating transactions. Because of the dollar price stability of stable coins, they have the potential to serve all the traditional functions of money, including acting as a medium of exchange. 
Stable coins could also improve upon traditional forms of money by increasing payment speed, reducing transaction costs, helping to combat illicit finance, and enabling programmable contracts. The proposed regulatory framework I've released will allow stable coins to continue flourishing while protecting consumers and minimizing potential risks from stable coins to the financial system. It's critical that Congress provide clarity in this area as soon as possible. Congress needs to enact a sensible regulatory framework before something bad happens with a stable coin that harms consumers. If that were to happen, Congress will rightfully share some of the blame. Thankfully, I'm optimistic that the administration is working with members of Congress and that we can find common ground on bipartisan legislation that addresses the risks of stable coins while also encouraging innovation and competition. Secretary Yellen, I look forward to hearing your testimony and discussing these and other important issues with you today. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Toomey. We'll hear from the Chair of FSOC today, Treasury Secretary Yellen. Uh, thanks for your service and your testimony. Please begin, Madam Secretary. Thank you so much, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and members of the committee. I'm pleased to speak with you today about the Financial Stability Oversight Council's 2021 Annual Report. The report is a collaborative effort of the council member agencies and it's a vehicle for providing Congress and the public with the Council's collective assessments of potential risks to U.S. financial stability. Today, I will highlight a few topics in the report and provide an update on the Council's activities since the report's publication. First, the report discusses vulnerabilities in the non-bank financial sector which were highlighted by the turmoil in financial markets in March 2020. While the Dodd-Frank Act reforms increased the resiliency of the U.S. financial system, the market turmoil in March 2020 demonstrated that the liquidity mismatch and use of leverage by some non-bank financial institutions can make them vulnerable to acute financial stresses and these stresses can be transmitted and amplified to the broader financial system. The Council has taken steps to examine these risks, including reestablishing its hedge fund working group to develop an interagency risk monitoring system and to propose options to mitigate identified risks. And earlier this year, the Council issued a statement to express support for the Securities and Exchange Commission's efforts to reform money market funds and their work to consider potential reforms to open-end funds. The Council is also working to support improving the resilience of the Treasury market and is coordinating with the Interagency Working Group on Treasury Market Surveillance. Potential steps to be taken include improving data quality and availability, evaluating expanded central clearing, and enhancing trading venue transparency and oversight. The SEC has proposed certain reforms to enhance transparency and oversight over alternative trading systems that trade government securities. The SEC has also proposed updating the definition of a government securities dealer to include market participants that play an increasingly significant liquidity providing role in overall trading and market activity. And additional, additionally, the Office of Financial Research is working to fill identified data gaps for uncleared bilateral repurchase agreements through a pilot data collection, which should improve visibility into a major source of financing for non-bank financial institutions in Treasury markets. Additionally, the Council is working to ensure that financial institutions better understand their climate-related financial risks. In its October 2021 report on climate-related financial risk, the Council outlined how climate change can be a source of shocks to the financial system and increase risks to financial stability. To address these risks, the Council recommended that regulators build their capacity and expand their efforts to address climate-related risks, improve the availability of data, 
enhance and standardize disclosures, and assess and mitigate risk to financial stability. The Council has also formed its staff level climate related financial risk committee, which will serve as coordinating body for the Council to share information, facilitate the development of common approaches and standards, and foster communication across FSOC members. In addition, the Council is establishing the Climate Related Financial Risk Advisory Committee. This advisory body, which will include a broad array of external stakeholders, will help the Council gather information and analysis on climate related financial risks. With respect to digital assets, new products and technology may present opportunities to promote innovation and increase, increase efficiencies. However, digital assets may pose risk to the financial system and increased and coordinated regulatory attention is necessary. On March 9th, President Biden signed an executive order calling for a comprehensive approach to digital asset policy. The Council is drafting a report that will identify financial stability risks and regulatory gaps. I look forward to working with you on the issues and opportunities posed by digital assets. We're also eager, eager to work with you to ensure that payment stable coins and their arrangements are subject to a federal prudential framework on a consistent and comprehensive basis. Finally, there's the potential for continued volatility and unevenness of global growth as countries continue to grapple with the pandemic. Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine has further increased economic uncertainty. The U.S. financial system has continued to function in an orderly manner, though valuations of some assets remain high compared with historical values. We stand firmly with the people of Ukraine and have implemented an unprecedented suite of sanctions on Russia that have been implemented by financial institutions. On February 28th, I convened the Council in the wake of the invasion, and we will continue to monitor developments and coordinate actions as the risks and threats evolve. The Council's report also discussed other potential emerging threats and vulnerabilities that the Council continues to monitor, including short-term wholesale funding markets, central counterparties, alternative reference rates, cybersecurity, corporate credit markets, and real estate markets. The Council remains committed to its mission of identifying and responding to risk to U.S. financial stability, and I look forward to working with this committee to promote a more robust and resilient financial system. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I have to step out to introduce an Ohioan at the, at the HELP Committee. Senator Menendez will begin the questioning, followed by Senator Toomey. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, welcome. I, I want to talk to you about some things that also can affect our economy. Uh, the ability to have full uh, control over one's reproductive health has real-world economic consequences. According to the Institute for Women's Policy Research, current state-level abortion restrictions already cost the United States about $105 billion annually due to reduced earning levels, increased job turnover, and time off for women. So, Secretary Yellen, uh, if the draft of the court's majority holding in Roe versus Way is the actual decision, what impact will the loss of abortion access mean economically for women? Well, I believe that eliminating the right of women to make decisions about when and whether to have children would have very damaging effects um, on the economy and would set women back decades. Roe v. Wade and access to reproductive health care, including abortion, helped lead to increased labor force participation. It enabled uh, many women to finish school that increased their earning potential. It allowed women to plan and balance their families and careers. And research also shows that it had a favorable impact on the well-being and earnings um, of, of children. 
Um, there are many research studies that have been done um, over the years looking at the economic mm -hmm. impacts of access or lack thereof to abortion, and it makes clear that denying women access to abortion increase their odds of living in poverty or need for public assistance. For half of the uh, population of America, eliminating a right that has existed for half a century, particularly for low-income and minority women who have already shouldered much of the burden from the COVID pandemic would be a, a disaster. Uh, let me turn to something else. The, uh, the Federal Reserve Chair, Chairman Powell, has acknowledged that part of the labor shortage is being fueled by an inordinately high number of retirements. According to the most recent figures from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are now two job openings per unemployed worker in the country. It's about 11 million jobs that are going unfilled, which has an economic consequence by virtue of them going unfilled. In short, we just don't have enough people to replace those who are leaving the labor force. Now, what we do have is thousands of hardworking immigrants who are willing to work uh, if Congress would simply allow them to do so. Uh, would addressing the immigration visa backlog uh, help shore up the labor supply and therefore the supply chain as a whole? Senator, I agree with you. I think that it would be very helpful, especially under the conditions that you described. The labor market is arguably as tight with about as large a supply, demand, and balance as we've seen in U.S. post-war history. We've had a decline in legal immigration, and um, I think that taking steps to shore up um, our workforce, uh, for example, you referred to the enormous backlog um, of applications. I believe that people, uh, immigrants who have had legal work permits and need to have them renewed, um, have faced very substantial backlogs. And uh, the, I think the White House recently announced that it's taking steps to make sure that uh, those individuals will be able to work um, in spite of the backlog. Well, I, ho uh, I, hope, I hope we can get there, because even leading business groups agree that robust immigration reform is urgently needed to address our labor shortage. Uh, and um, uh, they're not necessarily a voice in this regard, but they are uh, because they've come to that conclusion themselves. Uh, finally, uh, talking about the labor market shortage uh, playing a major role in the slowed economic recovery, according to the Peterson Institute for Economics, the employment rates of parents with young children have declined by 4.5% over the pandemic with concentration impacts among women, especially women of color. This is even more troubling as women with young children uh, account for 12% of the U.S. workforce. Uh, how would investing in child care uh, strengthen our nation's labor market uh, and unleash our capacity for economic growth? Well, I think the ability of a family to access affordable child care is um, a critical um, prerequisite for women to be able uh, to participate in the labor force. Um, the United States does less than many countries um, in making sure that women do have affordable uh, child care. And um, the president has made proposals that would serve to make child care more affordable. I think he's made proposals um, for universal uh, access to um, two years of pre-K, um, and I think these proposals would um, certainly boost uh, labor force participation. $13,000 on the average cost a year uh, for child care. Uh, it is, uh, for many families, prohibitive, and if not, takes a significant part. So I, I agree with you. Finally, uh, I just hope uh, we had spoken in the past about my efforts and legislation to create a capital increase for the Inter-American Development Bank. We are facing China's challenge throughout the hemisphere. The one entity that can be helpful to us in meeting that challenge is the Inter-American Development Bank. And uh, while I see that Treasury has taken some steps to move forward with an increase, I don't believe that we are working together 
uh, as I had uh, envisioned. So I would ask you to have some personal attention to it. Thank you. Senator Toomey. Thank you, Senator Menendez. Secretary Yellen, um, as I mentioned during my uh, opening remarks, um, I've been encouraged that the administration has recognized the importance of stablecoin regulation and the fact that it is a responsibility of Congress to define the broad parameters of that. And as you know, I released uh, a discussion draft of a bill that would, in fact, regulate stable coins. It would protect consumers by establishing new standardized federal disclosure requirements. Among other things, it would also establish a new federal license. So I, I would I'd like to ask if you can confirm for the record here that it is still your view that it is important, I would argue even urgent, for Congress to pass legislation governing the regulation of payment stable coins. Yes, I'm happy to confirm that, Senator Toomey. Um, the uh, President's Working Group issued a report um, concluding that current statutory and regu regulatory frameworks don't provide consistent and comprehensive standards for the risks of stable coins as a new type of payment product and uh, urges Congress to enact legislation uh, to ensure that stable coins and such arrangements have a federal prudential framework. I would urge um, bipartisan action uh, to create such a framework. Um, we would look forward to uh, working with you. Uh, I would note that there was a report just this morning um, in the Wall Street Journal that a stable coin known as Te Terra USD um, experienced a run and had declined in value. And um, well, so it, I, I think that simply illustrates that this is a rapidly growing uh, product and um, that there, there are risks to financial stability and we need a framework that's, that's appropriate. I appreciate that. I do think it's important to note that the the stable coin to which you refer, I believe, is an algorithmic stable coin. I believe and, that's correct. And um, so it, that means, by definition, it's not backed by cash or securities uh, as the, if you can call them, more conventional stable coins. Um, so I think that's an important distinction, but I t I'm grateful for your point. I hope you will agree to work with me and my colleagues who are interested in getting something done. Do you think we could shoot for a goal of getting legislation done this year? I, I think it would be highly appropriate. Um, the outstanding stock of stable coins is growing um, at, a, at a very rapid rate, and we really need a consistent federal framework. I really look forward to working with you and um, members of Congress to um, devise legislation that would accomplish that. Great, thank you. Uh, let me move on to um, the FSOC's focus on climate change. You spoke uh, at some length about climate change during your opening remarks, and I've observed that I think seven of the recent 10 meetings have been about climate change. So do you uh, subscribe to what I think is the administration's general paradigm for this, that the risk to the financial system comes in two categories, one physical risk, associated with severe weather events, and the other transition risk that's associated with an evolution away from fossil fuels. Is that, do you subscribe to that paradigm, or do you think there's another category of risks? I would agree with you that those are the main risks. Okay. So I, can you name a single financial institution in America that has failed as a result of a severe weather event in the last 50 years? I'm not, I'm not aware of... Um, yeah. So I, I don't think there that, has been one. And every single year we have blizzards, we have hurricanes, we have wildfires, and sometimes they're horrendous. Um, and some of them have been recent. But we've never had a single financial institution fail, much less the entire financial system. So I think it's pretty clear, and actually I think Chairman Powell acknowledged, there's really no physical risk that's even remotely imminent. So then that brings us to the transition risk. Well, I suspect that over time we're going to have a transition away from fossil fuels to other forms of energy. It certainly looks like that's going to take quite a while. I don't see how that's much different from the fact that consumer preferences change in all kinds of products and services. 
So I guess I would urge you to consider that risks like cybersecurity, I mean, I, I would think you would acknowledge cybersecurity poses a much more imminent risk to financial institutions and our financial system than e either physical risk from severe weather or climate change in general, right? Well, I think both um, create risks. But, but I said more imminent. Is, is cybersecurity more imminent risk? Cybersecurity is certainly an imminent risk. It's one that the council is very focused on. The Treasury Department has special responsibilities. I, I to understand, but you, you're choosing not to acknowledge that cybersecurity is a more imminent risk than climate risk. And I think that's kind of surprising because it's so obvious to most people. Cybersecurity is a, a, a real-time, continuous risk to every single financial institution in America. There's constant bombardments of attacks, and if one major one gets through, it could be devastating. Climate change does not pose that kind of imminent risk. I think climate change is an existential threat um, to, to our globe and to our future. You can see that countries, it, it is a long-term risk, but it is becoming notably more severe and you can see a growing number of countries take significant steps um, to address this risk. Financial institutions themselves have um, voluntarily decided that they need to align their portfolios with um, a, a framework of net zero by 2050. And um, that's really in the absence of any requirement that they do so. Um, I do believe that transition risks are very real as more and more countries adopt uh, frameworks that are meaningful to address <clears throat> climate change. We could, be, we could see significant changes in asset valuations that um, pose risk to financial institutions. Well, uh, there's a lot we disagree on there, but uh, my time has expired. Um, I think Senator Warner is with us remotely. Senator Warner. I, I am Senator Toomey, and, and uh, let me uh, follow up on a couple items. I just, uh, one, uh, look forward to working with you and Secretary Yellen on a rational approach to regulation around not only stable coins, but uh, crypto generally. Um, I think we've seen very recently certain companies that were maybe companies in the software business that have gone out and way over leveraged themselves to buy Bitcoin. And uh, unfortunately, their values uh, disappearing um, real time as we see this uh, transition go through in the market. And I, I would uh, point out two quick things. I, in terms of the physical risk of climate change beyond simply the transition, um, I think there's an awful lot of folks in New Mexico right now who uh, experiencing the fires would say that is a visceral, real human risk. And I think on a broader basis, and I, I would I would hope uh, our colleagues would all look at this, literally in India, in India at this point, um, if they don't get appropriate range, you may have wide swaths of the Indian population not literally being able to even live uh, with the, the level of heat exposure. Uh, and if you have a dramatic uh, meltdown in the Indian economy, I actually think uh, that will be Unfortunately, maybe the first direct, into, uh, uh, immediate physical risk coming about from climate change. Again, I hope uh, we prove to be wrong, but that seems where we're headed. Um, Secretary Yellen, I want to get to at least a couple questions in here. One, I commend what you and, and all of FSOC entities have been doing in terms of um, tightening up sanctions on Vladimir Putin's aggressive actions. Um, I, I'd like you to Two quick comments in my first question. One, any kind of macro idea of how we're doing in terms of ratcheting down on the Russian economy? And two, I was really uh, interested in seeing um, Treasury's announcements on Sunday to say we are going to go down to the services level because I, I do fear that uh, Putin, the oligarchs, and others are setting up other shell companies and entities where we could have leakage uh, uh, in terms of getting away from sanctions. Frankly, I, I go back to this, to the crypto arena where Senator Warren and I have said we need to make sure that those crypto exchanges not based in America, where there are some at least basic regulatory framework, uh, but those based abroad, uh, that they are not 
sources of leakage. So can you talk about on the macro basis and um, some of the things that drove you to your Sunday additional regulations? Well, on a macro basis, I think that our uh, sanctions are having a very severe impact on Russia, and Russia itself has acknowledged that. Um, their economy is clearly in a recession. Um, it's forecast that it will contract at least in the 10 to 15 percent range this year. Um, inflation has been running probably around 20 percent this year. And uh, Russian, Russian firms that have been sanctioned are finding it almost impossible uh, to gain access to goods and services that they need in global markets. This includes major defense firms that are unable to buy uh, semiconductors and other components that they need uh, to restock um, to their defense arsenals uh, as they use up equipment in Ukraine. Um, Can you, could you speak to the question about, because I do want to get one more question in here, about where you meant on the accounting services and others, and yes. frankly, I'm still concerned about leakage uh, yes. uh, through unregulated uh, non-American um, um, you know, crypto exchanges yes. in terms of oligarchs trying to get some of their money out. Yes, we, we took the actions we did last Sunday uh, for service providers to make sure, uh, I think, especially some of the oligarchs um, use these services to figure out ways to shield their uh, money uh, from sanctions, and uh, we wanted to clamp down on that and put an end to it, um, along with all the other things that we're doing through the Repo Task Force, DOJ and Treasury, um, exchanging information globally with our partners that have greatly enhanced our ability to seize oligarch. Um, let me, let me, let me just, because I want to, uh, I know my colleagues have gone a couple minutes over, but uh, uh, Chairman Brown may be coming back when they cut me off, so I want to get my last uh, piece in here. Um, one of the things we've been doing on the Intel Committee in a bipartisan basis is bringing in different industry sectors and talking about the, the real challenge that China poses in terms of economic policy in terms of technology, uh, in terms of, of intellectual property theft. We recently had in some of the finance industry, and while they were concerned about Russia, it, it was like the light went off on there, suddenly saying, oh my gosh, we could have this same kind of, of potential decoupling with China uh, should President Xi increase his uh, belligerent and aggressive actions and try to follow the Putin game plan uh, if he if he attacks Taiwan. Do you think our the, the financial sector is appropriately building in uh, the potential risks of, of China taking aggressive action and then what might be our and the West reaction to that? That's a really uh, difficult question I probably can't answer in the time that I have. I think you're raising a very important issue. Um, what I see is that businesses in the financial community are becoming much more aware of the risks that they face um, in investing in China. And I think this is something that really demands um, our, our intense focus going forward. I think we, I hope I could work with my colleagues on that. And thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Warner. Uh, Senator Scott from South Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member, for holding this hearing. Secretary Yellen, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, uh, some of your comments in response to Bob's question I found troubling. And I, 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 just for clarity's sake, did you say that ending the life of a child is good for the labor force participation rate? Giving someone the access, let me just quote what you said, that ultimately increasing access to abortion uh, and re reproductive health care allows for our labor force participation rate to continue to increase, that denying women access to abortion increases their odds of living in poverty or need for public assistance as a guy who was raised by a single mom who worked long hours to keep us out of poverty. I think people can disagree on the issue of being pro-life or, 
or, or pro-abortion, but in the end, I think framing it in the context of labor force participation is, it just feels calloused to me. I, I think uh, finding a way to have a debate around abortion in a, a, a meeting for the economic stability of our country is harsh. Uh, and I'm just surprised that we find ways to weave into every facet of our lives such, such an important and painful reality for so many people to make it sound like it's just a, another 0.4% added to our labor force participation as a result of the issue of abortion just, to me, seems harsh. And well, I, I certainly don't mean to um, say what I think the effects are in a manner that's harsh. What we're talking about is um, whether or not women will have the ability um, to regulate their reproductive um, situation in ways that will enable them to plan lives that are fulfilling and satisfying for them. And one aspect of a satisfying life is being able to feel that you have the financial resources to raise a child, that the children you bring into the world are wanted, and that you have the ability to take care of them in many cases, um, abortions are of teenage women, um, particularly low income and often black, who um, aren't in a position to be able to care for children, have um, unexpected pregnancies, and it deprives them of the ability often to continue their education, to later participate in the workforce. So there, there is a spill over into labor force participation, yeah. but, it. and uh, it means that children will grow up in poverty yeah. and do, do worse themselves. Thank and you. Let me, let me is, just explain my time harsh. on the topic. This is I, the truth. I'll just simply say that as a guy raised by a black woman in abject poverty, I'm thankful to be here as United States Senator first. Second thing I'd say is that we, we can at the same time have a real conversation about increasing child tax credits that are refundable. We can at the same time have a conversation about the opportunity to have a, a, a more, more robust system around the issue of child care, of early childhood education. We could have a conversation about financial literacy. There's a lot of ways for us to address the issue about the child that's here. So th that just to me was, was, was a, a unusually piercing comments that you, that you made. I, I will say on uh, my prepared question that in face of persistent inflation, uh, I think caused in many ways by the $2 trillion package that was approved in early 21 that was followed by a $1.2 trillion package that both combined led to an overheating of our economy, slowing growth caused by a backlog uh, pipeline driven by too much demand with too little supply, uh, followed by a lagging labor force participation rate People uh, aren't coming back to work, though we have millions of jobs that are open. The atrophying of the muscle for work seems to be endemic uh, in this current uh, Biden administration's approach, coupled with government debt that is now well over uh, $30 trillion and growing very fast. How do we justify looking at the Build Back Broker plan or the Build Back Better plan and saying to ourselves that more money in the economy is going to help us to reduce the inflationary effect where the average person today is paying $4.37 for the average uh, 87 unleaded gas? Well, um, the American Rescue Plan, that's not Build Back Better, was designed to mitigate what at the time seemed to be the most significant and worrisome risk facing the economy, which was that unemployment would stay high, the labor market would remain weak, and especially low-income households would lose the roofs over their heads and be unable to put food on the table. And 
be permanently scarred um, by the pandemic. And at the time, forecasts were really quite dire, including those of the Congressional Budget Office and outsiders, and no one really knew just how significant the risks were. The American Rescue um, Plan was a large package. It was targeted at the needs, um, particularly of those who were most severely affected by the pandemic. And um, when you look at the state of the labor market, as you described, the fact that it is so strong, um, maybe overly strong, overly hot, is in a way a sign of the success of that program and mitigating what could have been another Great Depression, a risk that we should not have been willing to take. I, I now, mean, inflation I, I, is clearly a problem. I think Chairman it, Brown's going to tell us both we're out of time. So let me uh, just finish with this, uh, just a perhaps... Statement, not a question, correct? Sir? Perhaps, yes, of course. Perhaps better say what I said, which is, number one, the $1.9 trillion rescue plan followed by the $1.2 trillion infrastructure plan with another BBB on the table for more spending was the delineation between the three categories of spending that I believe two already passed that have overheated the economy and then having a third package on the table to once again continue to provide more stimulus to economy that can't take the stimulus that's already been from If, if you look years. at the president's budget, you will see that it is fully paid for uh, through higher tax collections and that the budget also incorporates substantial deficit reduction. Thank yeah. you, Senator Scott. Uh, Senator Smith from Minnesota, from her office. If not, uh, Senator Cortez Masto is next from her office, and Cortez Masto from Nevada. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Secretary, thank you for being here. But let me just uh, couch a couple of things uh, in response to Senator Scott. One, let's not forget, uh, we started down this path with some $1.9 trillion uh, uh, tax cuts for the very wealthy uh, that have not been paid for. Uh, my colleagues seem to forget that's kind of where we started here. The rest are, are, are uh, bipartisan, and the bipartisan infrastructure package, not only is it paid for, it's a benefit to the state of Nevada, and it's long-term investments uh, over the years. So. That's one. Two, I want to associate myself with Senator Menendez's comments, uh, both about uh, abortion restriction and its economic impact on women. It is true. There are studies that show that. I would ask Senator Scott this question. Um, you can't know everyone's circumstances. I appreciate his circumstances, and, it, and, and he is very proud of it. I think that's fantastic. But why impose your experience and your circumstances on others until you walk in their shoes? That's all we're asking. Um, and then let me start with, um, Secretary, the cryptocurrency, because I do believe, um, and I want to be a part of this discussion, we do need a regulatory framework for stable coins. Last week, Fabio Panetta, one of the European Central Bank's six executive board members, noted that the cryptocurrency market is now larger than the subprime mortgage market, uh, which was triggered the global financial crisis. Nobody knows that better than uh, us in the state of Nevada. And he says this, $1.3 trillion uh, market shows strikingly similar dynamics. There are about 10,000 crypto assets now. So my question, um, Madam Secretary, is one financial risk pros, um, posed by cryptocurrencies is the concentration of ownership. Do you see any financial risk because professional investors and high net worth individuals hold almost two thirds of the Bitcoin supply? So I'm not sure if um, the concentration of holdings among um, high wealth investors, if that's true, poses in and of itself a financial risk unless those investors happen to be leveraged so that a decline in the value of the assets can trigger financial distress, which spills over to others. But um, certainly I think there are many uh, risks associated with uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, and the, the president has asked uh, the Treasury and FSOC to look at those risks. We will issue a comprehensive report shortly. The president's working group is also, has also already described the risks we see in connection with 
one form of crypto assets, which is stable coins, and there we see run risks, which could threaten financial stability, risks associated with the payment system and its integrity, and risks associated with um, increased concentration if stable coins are issued by uh, firms that already have substantial market, market power. Um, so we definitely see significant risks here. Thank you. Let, let me jump to something else that is uh, impacting us in the state of Nevada, which is affordable housing uh, and the lack of, of housing supply. Our nation is short 5 million homes, uh, building homes, uh, especially those affordable for working families and seniors and so many others should be our top priority. Uh, can you address the financial stability risks to our economy posed by the increase in non-bank mortgage companies providing residential home financing? Well, it's certainly true that non-bank mortgage companies are playing a very large role. They tend to be quite dependent on short-run financing. And um, if there's volatility in the markets and a loss of that access, I do see some risks uh, relating to the role of non-banks uh, in the mortgage market. Thank you. Uh, and then finally, uh, I know, uh, and you talked about this, um, the administration has taken a, a leading role in assessing the climate-related risk to financial stability through some scenario analysis and disclosures. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, what have the financial regulatory agencies learned from those scenario analysis and disclosure requirements? Is that what you're referring to in some of the reporting that's been done? Well, um, another, a number of central banks around the world, I think the Bank of England is most advanced, have been evaluating the risks to key financial institutions by um, looking at how they would fare, what their losses in financial position would be if particular climate scenarios were to play out, and looking at different scenarios, one where there's a gradual imposition of policies to address climate change, others where there is very little action and then a great deal of action. Um, they design these scenarios and then use them to assess risk to financial institutions. And many of our supervisors are looking to do similar exercises, and it makes sense for FSOC to work jointly on trying to design such scenarios and collect the data that would be necessary to translate those scenarios into concrete assessments of risk to the particular financial institutions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Cortez Masto. Uh, Senator Rounds from South Dakota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Secretary, first of all, thanks for coming in and um, sharing with us in front of this committee today. Uh, the Federal Reserve wrote in its most recent supervision and regulation report released Friday that, and I quote, the banking system remains strong overall with robust capital and liquidity and improved asset quality, unquote. Would you agree with their statement? Yes, to the best of my knowledge, certainly. Thank you. Um, with regard to what we're doing right now in, in Russia, I just want to discuss it with you for a little bit. Up until now, bondholders have only been allowed to receive sovereign bond payments from Russia because of a special rule put in place by your department in late February. The General License 9A exemption authorizes U.S. persons to receive interest, dividend, or maturity payments on debt or equity uh, of the Russian government. Despite the extremely strong sanctions placed on their financial system, this has allowed money to flow out of Russia, depleting their stockpile of U.S. dollars. That exemption is poised to expire on May 25th. Their next payments are due on May 27th for bonds maturing in 2026 and 2036, two days after uh, the OFAC exemption is set to expire. Will Treasury allow this exemption to expire and allow Russia to default, or would you make other accommodations? So this is something we're actively examining right now we want to make sure that we understand what the potential consequences 
and spillovers would be of allowing the um, license to expire, and we have not yet made a decision. When would you expect that decision to be made? I mean, you're, you're talking right now, we're talking just a little over two weeks. It's shortly. Uh, we're, we're actively involved in an evaluation of um, the risks and impact of, of not renewing the license. There would be some sort of a report from your department prior to this point. It simply wouldn't be ignored at this stage of the game. I'm you sorry, don't expect ignored? To, yeah, well, you wouldn't, we would not expect that you would simply allow it to expire without further announcements of what your plan is. We would certainly announce um, if we intend to al allow it to expire. Or other options available. Yes, of okay, course. Th thank you. Uh, uh, Madam Secretary, our debt as a share of GDP, most economically and meaningful play, uh, a measure of debt, has climbed above 120 uh, percent in September and November. I asked you when we should say enough is enough when it comes to our debt and deficit. You felt that since the cost of servicing our debt had been negative due to a long stretch of low rates, our debt has been less burdensome. However, due to skyrocketing inflation, the Fed just raised rates by 50 basis points for the first time since 2000, and we could see five more hikes before the end of the year. Do you think it's finally time to start sounding the alarm bells? And if not now, what level of interest rates would alarm you? Well, I do feel we have to make sure that um, the United States is on a sound fiscal path, and that's an important priority obviously for Treasury and for the administration. Um, the projections that were made in the budget um, assume that interest rates will rise over time, that they were abnormally low. And so my statement that real interest costs were um, quite low, uh, of course they would rise over time, but still remain at quite low levels even if interest rates increase. But certainly longer term, we have known for a long time that um, as we have an aging population, that um, a larger share of US GDP will go to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and that we need to address issues in connection with financing those programs um, if we fail to attend to them, that most very long-run analyses show um, debt, debt growing um, in a manner that could be worrisome. Um, at the moment, the debt-to-GDP ratio is um, not, not increasing. Um, revenues are coming in very strong. Uh, this year, the deficit will um, decline by we expect by over one and a half trillion dollars. And my guess is that um, CBO and others will be revising down somewhat their likely path for the debt to GDP ra ratio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator, Ron, uh, Thank Senator, you. Thanks, Senator, Ron, Senator Reed from Rhode Island is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam Secretary, for your service. Uh, uh, last year, our economy grew by 5.7%. Unemployment's down to 3.6 percent. We've added 8.3 million new jobs under President Biden, including over 2 million last year alone. In fact, when I go out and talk to any type of business, their major complaint is they can't find workers. And this is probably the best year to graduate uh, from high school, college, or anyplace else to find a job. Uh, and what would our nation as the economy and job numbers look like if Congress and the administration had not passed the American Rescue Plan last year? I mean, when President Biden became assumed office, the unemployment rate was very high, um, and there was a great deal of uncertainty whether or not um, it, as to how the pandemic would progress and a real possibility that unemployment would um, end up rising to Great Depression levels. Um, it, we worried not only about mean outcomes, but also the tail risk that um, we could see a very weak labor market. And the memory of 2008, the fact that it took a decade to recover from the financial crisis, that uh, the consequence was 
Um, many people graduated from college, went into the job market, couldn't find anything, and saw a permanent impact on their life chances. Um, and of course, so many people lost homes and jobs and uh, encountered scarring. And at the time, we were seeing cars lined up in um, parking lots waiting to get food at food banks because they can, couldn't keep enough food on the table and were risking roofs over their heads. So um, the focus was on um, aiding those people and promoting a strong job market recovery. Now, inflation is absolutely a problem, and it's critical mm -hmm. to address it. But I think at the same time, we should recognize how successful that plan was in leading to an economy where instead of having a um, large number of workers utterly unable to find jobs, exactly the opposite is true. Oh, thank you very much. And as you point out, inflation is a difficult issue. My sense is it, it, it was triggered by supply interruptions caused by COVID. Then it was exacerbated uh, by the uh, outbreak of war in the Ukraine and the uh, disruption of the, the world uh, energy markets. Uh, gasoline is, is something that's a, a fairly good barometer, and it's uh, reached historic uh, levels, or at least uh, in the last decade or so. Uh, yeah. We have to deal with that. So what, what are, are you and the president doing to deal with that? So uh, let me first say I agree with your diagnosis that the factors you mentioned have been extremely important. Um, the president has taken actions um, in a wide array of areas. With respect to energy prices, um, he, he's announced historic a release of a million barrels a day from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to hold down uh, gas prices, allowing uh, domestic private suppliers time to ramp up production. Um, I think many domestic oil producers expected the recovery to be weak, and um, oil demand had diminished, and they didn't invest um, in drilling in uh, producing wells, so supply diminished, and it's going to take a while for them to ramp up supply. And in the meantime, we have these uh, strategic petroleum uh, releases. Um, on the supply chain side, that's been very important source of inflation. The president's worked tirelessly to um, deal with backlogs at the ports uh, to make sure that um, there are an adequate supply of truckers um, to work to make sure that there is adequate uh, sup uh, room for um, storage of containers that are coming off ships. But, you know, the supply disruptions continue. There are many related to what's happening in Russia, Ukraine, that the, the war obviously has impacts on energy markets, and now we have COVID situation in China that's leading to further supply disruptions. So um, there's a broad program to address inflation. Obviously, the Federal Reserve has a role, and um, the Federal Reserve is, um, we recognize, independent and charged with doing what they think necessary, but we're working on the things that we can as well. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Thanks, Senator Reed. Thank uh, Senator Tillis from North Carolina is recognized from his office. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you for being here. I wasn't going to ask a question about energy, but uh, Senator Reed's question and your response to it, uh, I feel like uh, I have to drill down a little bit, no pun intended. But within hours of the president being endorsed, he signed an order to pull the permit for the XL pipeline. We talk about a shortage of truckers and transportation, but this administration sent a very clear message on day one that the infrastructure that energy production requires for those capital expenditures and expanded drilling in the United States to make sense from a business perspective, sent a very clear message before the sunset on the first day of his presidency that that wasn't going to be a priority of this administration. It seems to me that we can 
attribute some of the increase in energy to what's going on in Ukraine. But isn't it rational uh, to also say that the posture of this administration and the message that they've sent for domestic energy production is also another factor in rising energy prices? So, Senator, I think with respect to the Keystone Pipeline, this is um, something, it doesn't really have anything to do with the supply of oil. And it's no, something it that do, would be years. What it has to do is with the, excuse me, Madam Secretary, because I do want to get to some of the questions, but it has to do with the underlying cost and the long-term certainty that an industry needs before they're going to make capital expenditure investments. Um, we can go in, and, and I don't expect you to answer this question, but I do think it's something that we all have to be intellectually honest about. Uh, so, the the so. not more than 9,000 permits that the administration supposedly uh, says uh, opens the doors to energy exploration here, only about half of them are viable, and even those are in question because of other policies that the administration have taken on actually authorizing the use of it. We know within a week of the administration being in office, we've seen the correspondence out to um, supervisors uh, among the states saying that you can't make decisions to move forward with extraction. That's something that has to go through the White House. I don't expect you to get into that, but I well, do believe that we have to understand there's a reason for energy prices going up and only a portion of which can be attributed to the geopolitical situation that we're in right now. Sen Actually, Senator, I, I want to ask, go ahead. You know, I feel with the real moral of the situation we face is that as long as we are as dependent as we are on fossil fuels in our energy supply, that we will always face vulnerabilities from the decisions of Russia or other countries. We oh, face I agree. geopolitical I agree. risk. And I what also, we need to do is Secretary to, Yellen, we I, need I agree a transition with that. to renewables. Secretary Yellen, and if, 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 if you, I could get you to yield for a minute. Change. If I can get you to yield for a minute, you can also see the risk of going too soon. That's why we have uh, European nations that are struggling to figure out because they went so far that they actually stopped drilling. I'll give you a classic example in Germany. They have energy resources in Germany. They shut them down and they just replaced their fossil fuels with fossil fuels coming from Russia. So if we don't get the transition right, I've supported renewables for years. That's why we have a prospering solar uh, economy in North Carolina. But if we don't get it right and we're not extracting natural gas, for example, that's a fraction of the carbon footprint, we're expediting a transition and putting ourselves at risk in the process. But I want to move on to something that is in your lanes. One question I have with the help of the chairman and, and in collaboration with Senator Tester, we were able to get the LIBOR transition legislation passed. How is the implementation going? I, I think that's very helpful and uh, really appreciate Congress doing that. Um, we're in a transition phase and um, we see that banks are now um, moving off LIBOR um, as they've been required to do with a clear end date to when it's going to be produced. And I think they're making a good progress in transitioning to SOFR. Um, I'd say the progress is a little bit less good when it comes to loan products that um, uh, it's, the progress has been very good on derivatives. Um, we, we do think it's important that um, banks choose indices that are robust based on strong data. Uh, we have some concerns that we mentioned in the FSOC report over credit-related uh, indices that uh, banks may use, but generally I'd say the transition is going well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Chair. Thank you, Senator Tell. Senator uh, Warren from Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the crash of 2008, we saw how financial institutions that were not banks could be big enough and risky enough to bring down our whole economy. It was the collapse of a few non-banks, the investment companies Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, the insurance giant AIG, that triggered the crisis and caused millions of families to lose their jobs, their homes, and their retirement savings. Now, in response, Congress created FSOC 
to prevent such a crash from ever happening again. And one of the most powerful tools we gave to FSOC was the ability to designate non-bank firms as, quote, systemically important financial institutions, or SIFIs, and subject them to the same oversight as the big, too big to fail banks. Today, these non-bank firms include asset managers that oversee trillions of dollars in assets, exceeding the GDPs of just about every nation on Earth, mortgage companies that originate 60% of home loans in the United States, and hedge funds, private equity firms, and investment companies that operate in the shadows of, financial, of the financial system. Those companies control huge amounts of the U.S. and the worldwide economy, which means their mismanagement or failure could threaten the entire economic system. Even so, in 2019, the Trump administration, under the Trump administration, FSOC issued revised guidance that significantly weakens the Council's ability to conduct this oversight. But don't take my word for it. Secretary Yellen, you, along with Fed Chair Ben Bernanke and former Treasury Secretaries Tim Geithner and Jack Lew, wrote a letter in 2019 opposing the revised guidance. You stated that the changes would, quote, neuter the designation authority, close quote, and, quote, amount to a substantial weakening of the post-crisis reforms, end quote. You also say that the 2019 guidance would, quote, make it impossible to prevent the buildup of risk in financial institutions whose failure would threaten the stability of the system as a whole, end quote. That sounds pretty serious. Do you still agree with that, Secretary Yellen? Yes, I do. Good. Under the Trump administration, regulators chipped away at the rules bit by bit, leaving our financial system and American families less safe. Restoring FSOC's ability to prevent giant corporations from taking our economy down again is a critical step to building those defenses back up. So, Secretary Yellen, you have already joined others to say how dangerous you think it is that the 2019 SIFI guidance uh, change was, and now you have the power to do something about it. Will you reverse the risky 2019 guidance this year? We're looking at this very carefully and um, examining what our options are. Um, we'll be discussing this with other members of the council. So I continue to hold the same set of views. But I do want to say um, designation is not the only tool that was given to FSOC to address um, financial stability risks in the non-bank financial sector. Um, activity-based regulations are also relevant. And so there are two kinds of tools. Sometimes designation is clearly the right tool when there is an institution who, whose failure could threaten financial stability. It's the right tool. But sometimes, and I would give you money market funds as an example, um, there is a practice that um, occurs throughout the financial sector. Many firms are involved in it. The risk comes from um, the activities or the structures that many firms have that risk. Um, in situations of that sort, um, an activity-based approach may be relevant. And I want to say that FSOC has been very focused ever since the day I became Treasury Secretary on risks in the non-bank financial sector. We have focused on money market funds. We have focused on open-end mutual funds where there can be run risks and hedge funds. And an activity-based analysis or potential regulations in all of these cases from the SEC or further data gathering. Um, I, I think that's the right approach there as I just, opposed to I, I appreciate that, Secretary Yellen, and, but we're going to run out of time here. I just want to remind you, though, I will quote Yellen to Yellen on this. The letter you co-led said, quote, activity-based approaches cannot address risks that are tied to the funding, leverage, and combination of activities within a corporation, end quote. It also says, quote, Congress created the FSOC 
with both, both designation authority and the authority to review and make recommendations regarding activities. Congress did not intend for one authority to be used as a prerequisite for the other, end quote. My only point here is that with that 2019 designation that you wrote this letter against, it has altered that balance, and I want to see that balance come well, back I, into play. I, I agree with that. I think both tools should be available, and one should not be a prerequisite to another, in my view. Good. But we need both tools and hope to um, look I very carefully well. at the designation. Stronger rules to protect our economy. Thank, agree. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Warren. Agreed. Uh, Senator Kramer of, Kramer of North Dakota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, I cannot resist um, getting back to the issue of, of energy. You, you said a couple of questions ago that, um, that oil producers in the United States didn't adequately anticipate, or something to this effect, anticipate the robust return to demand, and that, that, and that as a consequence, they did not respond by producing quickly enough. Is that basically what you said? Well, prices were very low for a time. Mm -hmm. Many energy co companies suffered losses. Um, I think they were gun shy about putting themselves in a similar position. And so they cut production and investment and were probably surprised to see the rapid recovery and run up uh, in oil prices that resulted. Since that time, though, there has been a run-up in oil prices. I don't necessarily agree with your assessment of the situation there, but giving you the benefit of the doubt, let me tell you what else they respond to. They respond to chilling market signals being sent by this administration every single day. And this hearing is a pretty good example of it. When I look at FSOC action on climate-related financial risks, it is one message after another after another. Do not produce more oil in the United States of America. You've got John Kerry running around the world saying, don't buy ours, buy somebody else's. Um, you, you've got the, 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 not, the, uh, the moratorium on federal, on federal drilling. You, you know, now they open up 20% of the available drilling, but, they, but the, then they, they announce that they're not going to allow any drilling on the 20 acres that are open for easements, or 20% open for easements. But FSOC itself, including um, the, the SEC evaluating these disclosure rules, it's chilling. these are chilling messages. Uh, the the Fed, Fed, with its two committees to better understand climate risks and incorporate committees into to supervision of financial firms, even the Department of Defense, as we evaluate the National Defense Authorization Act, the President's budget, five times in his opening statement to the Armed Services Committee, Secretary of Defense um, Lloyd Austin used the word climate change five times, five times, while there's a war being fought in Europe where, where energy has been weaponized, where, the, where this administration itself has helped weaponize oil. And, and you, know what's ha you know what else? You, you, earlier... Um, Senator Cortez Masto said inflation started with a $1.9 trillion tax cut and that, that, that they're what led to an economy. Let me tell you what they led to. They led to an economy where we became energy dominant because not only did the previous administration cut taxes, it cut regulations. And we became the number one producer of oil and gas in the world. And our dominance at that same time lowered greenhouse gas emissions. If the goal is better climate action, produce more in the United States. We are living at a time when our friends in Europe are pleading with us. They voluntarily have cut themselves off from hostile energy production in, in, in Russia and other places. This administration went to Venezuela for help. And then they went to the SPRO, to your point. And now we have, uh, you know, not, not completely depleted, but less oil in the in uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve at a much higher price to replenish it. It's done nothing to help inflation. It's only helped drive up costs. I could go on and on. I, I, don't, I don't want to be the person that doesn't give you a minute to, to respond to all of this, but I'm all for aspirations, and I think a 2050 fantasy is a great aspiration, but there's a 2022 reality facing the American consumer, facing the globe, facing national security, international security. And I, I just think let's get every regulator back in their own lane and let's deal with the reality in 2022. I'll give you a moment to respond. Well, I agree with you that there is going to be a transition path 
um, with respect to energy, and I don't think that anybody believes that we can switch completely to renewables um, in the short term. But uh, the current, well, the current situation certainly emphasizes the need for energy production now from fossil fuels. It should remind us, um, especially coupled with the increasingly dire predictions of scientists, that our grandchildren won't be able to have an inhabitable planet if we don't address the risks associated with climate change. We should not lose our focus on the need to transition as rapidly as possible to a path in which fossil fuels play um, a much less important role. And um, financial institutions themselves have recognized this. Um, there's an alliance um, called GFANS that almost all the large American banks voluntarily signed up with that they've pledged voluntarily to um, align their own lending portfolios with a net zero by 2050 um, approach. So medium term, we need to move away from fossil fuels. Short term, obviously, we have a problem. And in the transition, though, we ought to be producing more American fossil fuels because when, as we produce more American fossil fuels and sell into the global marketplace, we reduce the emissions. We create a transition that's both useful for the investor and useful perhaps for those who are worried about climate change. And um, I've gone over my time. appreciate uh, thank, thank you, thank Senator you. Kramer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Smith from Minnesota is recognized from her office. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown, and thank you, Secretary Yellen. It's wonderful to see you uh, virtually. Um, I want to just follow up a bit on the questions that Senator Kramer was um, were, were raising. Um, I, for one, am pleased that FSOC has made it a priority to address climate-related risks, both transition risks and also physical risks. And as I think about Minnesota, um, uh, severe drought, flooding in the northwestern part of the state, right up next to where um, Senator Kramer is, um, and the risks just seem so clear. It only makes sense to me that we should have some sort of a systemic way of understanding them and being able to make comparisons across institutions, which I think is what is the goal of, of what you're working on. Here's just one example. A family today is take, takes out a 30-year mortgage um, that won't pay off until 2052. And by then, by 2052, parts of the country could experience a 15 inch rise in sea levels and a two and a half degree increase Fahrenheit of temperature rise. So um, that strikes me as something that financial institutions need to be paying close attention to. And as you say, they already are. Um, so Secretary Yellen, could you just address this? And how, how do you think, what would you, say to us about the pace of regulators moving to address this crisis and what more you want to see? So um, I definitely think that financial institutions, you're absolutely right, they make long-term loans, whether they're um, for mortgages or other kinds of loans, and they definitely need to be taking account of the risks that are emerging over a long, a long time period. So I think that's important. Um, I think we need private sector actors, including financial institutions, to be taking the long view. And we need to make sure that uh, they have the information that they need to evaluate their own risks, that supervisors and regulators need to be evaluating those risks as well. And that's an important part of the um, agenda of FSOC is to amass the information that will enable that evaluation of risks, both by financial institutions um, and by regulators. And uh, the SEC proposal on disclosure by firms, I think that's extremely important because um, investors, uh, uh, the huge investor community, asset managers, um, want to be able to um, understand the risks that they're undertaking when they invest in uh, firms. And without this kind of disclosure of climate-related risks, um, we're not providing the investor community uh, the information they know to allocate 
uh, capital properly. So I, I'm very supportive of the uh, SEC proposal, proposal um, to require disclosure of climate-related risks by firms. I think uh, the SEC's job is to make sure that investors uh, have the access to the information that they need to evaluate investments, and many countries around the globe are um, requiring this kind of disclosure as well. I completely agree with you. And of course, in a free market, a free market functions fairly when there is, you know, uh, you know, great information, widely shared and understood information. That transparency is a hallmark. And I think that that is, that is the goal here so that people aren't surprised, um, either investors or individual consumers or businesses, um, anybody, you know, isn't surprised. And it seems to me that there's a real a cost of, of inaction or slowness in this area as well, um, as we think about the, um, the, the not like, you know, you know, long, long time from now, but like right around the corner, um, right now risks. Um, I think Senator Warner talked about the current fires um, in New Mexico and the, um, we saw this in my state as well. I just would say that, you know, I talk to Minnesota farmers and ranchers about climate change all the time, and they don't, they see this risk as a current risk, not something that is gonna be happening a gazillion years from now. Um, I just have a minute or two left, and I want to um, go to the issue of rising home prices. As noted in FSOC's annual report, home prices rose 18% between August of 2020 and August of 2021, far exceeding the pace in years um, prior. Um, by one estimate, rents went up more than 11% nationally in 2021. Uh, this is a, a deep concern for all of us that want to see our economy uh, rebound um, from the pandemic and appreciate that this, um, this is um, a, a challenge, a housing challenge that existed before the pandemic, um, but has really been exacerbated by what's happening. So Secretary Yellen, could you um, talk a little bit about what is your expectation around housing prices um, and, and what more we ought to be doing to stabilize housing prices um, as we as we go forward? Yes. Well, we I think to start with, I think we have an extreme shortage of housing in the United States. We've been under building since the 2008 financial crisis. The pandemic then led to an increase in the demand for housing. Uh, there's been insufficient inventory. Um, and now with the supply chain problems we have, it's actually hard to complete houses that are under construction. The stock of housing under construction is at a 50-year high. Um, so we have a real housing problem, especially affordable housing in the United States. House prices are rising very rapidly. Um, my, my expectation is with house prices very high relative to rents and having um, increased rapidly in an environment of rising interest rates, mortgage rates have already gone up. Um, more than 200 basis points just in recent months. My guess is that house prices will uh, begin to uh, level, level off uh, in, in the not too distant future, um, but we do have a significant housing problem. Thank you. I know I'm out of town, uh, time, Mr. Chair. I just want to acknowledge and thank you for your work um, and the, um, the reconciliation package and many of our work to try to address some of these deep challenges around housing. And I hope that we'll be able to find a way to come back to that important work because it's so needed right now. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Smith. Senator Haggerty from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Toomey. Thank you very much for holding this hearing. Secretary Yellen, good morning to you. Um, Secretary Yellen, you and I have talked about this before. In fact, the past two times you've appeared before this committee, I've uh, talked with you about the confidential taxpayer information that ProPublica has been publishing. Each time I asked you for an update on the source of the leaks and the investigation that's underway to get to the bottom of that, the prior two meetings that we had, you were not able to update me. So I want to ask you now, more than a year has passed since the leaks of confidential taxpayer information have begun by ProPublica. Um, can you tell me, can you update this committee, the American people, on where you are with respect to the investigation in terms of the source of the leaks of confidential taxpayer information and, and how it continues to be published. Senator, I really wish I could update you. I um, really am anxious to see some results here as well. I regret that I'm not able to do so. Um, there are investigations that are ongoing by 
um, law enforcement agencies and also by the inspector generals. Um, I respect these are independent investigations as is appropriate and I certainly respect um, the authorities of these independent investigators to complete their work. Uh, I have not seen any um, information on what what is being found, and I, I am eager to see it just as you are. I'm sure it must be every bit as disturbing to you, if not more so, given your role. But millions of taxpayers are still required to give their confidential information to the IRS. And in the face of these leaks and the publication of this information in, in ways that may be perceived as perhaps partisan, uh, it could be hacking, we don't know, but it creates a great amount of mistrust among the American people. And I encourage you to do everything within your power, uh, Madam Secretary, to encourage this investigation to come to a conclusion, to get some results for the American people, certainly for this committee. Uh, I agree with you, it is quite, quite disturbing. And going forward, um, do you have a plan in place? Are you working on a plan to make certain that this type of leak doesn't happen again? Well, we have done everything within our power to make sure that um, there's not inappropriate access to such data. For example, there are some um, pieces of Treasury that for very good reasons based on their work um, have access to this information, to individual taxpayer information. And we've asked our own Inspector General to make sure that the controls that exist wherever that information is available are appropriate and working. And uh, he's reported that he's looked into it and that that's, that's not an issue, that the controls are adequate and are working. So that's the kind of thing we can do to make sure there's nothing in our structure that could create an opportunity for leaks. The, the um, IRS Inspector General is also examining uh, similar issues within IRS. I, I couldn't agree with you more. This is very damaging. I absolutely want this work to be done and to figure out well, thank you. how this happened. Thank you for your efforts on this. And again, the controls have obviously failed in the past because the leaks have occurred. However they occurred, I hope we'll get to the bottom of it, and I hope whoever did it will be made an extreme example of so that this never happens again. I, I agree with you, Senator. I'd like to turn to another point. Uh, last month, the Department of Treasury released the one-year progress report on what the department calls its equity action plan. On page seven, Treasury details its efforts to advance racial equity, including through IRS enforcement. Um, I find the notion uh, troubling that Treasury should potentially structure its policies with any particular group of Americans in mind rather than advancing economic opportunity for all Americans, regardless of their race or gender. So Secretary Yellen, could you elaborate on what specific plans Treasury may be pursuing or contemplating pursuing regarding racial equity in IRS enforcement? Well, so we simply want to make sure that um, there's nothing unintentional in um, techniques of enforcement used by the IRS that could result in um, unintentional discrimination. Um, it, you know, it's, it's possible, we, you know, we certainly can see, for example, that in, um, just, you know, in the conduct of enforcement that um, there might be undue attention uh, to, to certain kinds of, um, you know, issues that could unfairly discriminate by race, and we want to make sure that that isn't occurring. I hope so that's you can part of us. our racial equity program. I hope you can assure us that there will not be people targeted based on their race or gender or anything of that nature. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Senator. Secretary. Senator Chester of Montana is recognized. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. I also want to thank you for being here, Secretary Yellen. It's always good to see you. Um, it's not breaking news that last year we had a drought uh, impacted nearly every state. There might have been a sliver or two west of the Mississippi. Um, huge weather event that, by the way, I'm not sure we're out of the woods yet. Um, certainly not where I live, uh, seeding this weekend into dry dirt. If we don't get rain, it's not coming up. We've got fires in New Mexico, not even the fire season yet. Um, 
We don't do much about climate as far as a Congress goes, uh, and I think that's unfortunate because whether we want to admit it or not, Mother Nature bats last. Uh, I am worried about the impact on small businesses, community banks, agriculture, and quite frankly, the economy in general, not to mention the kind of money that, that we're putting out every year in disasters. So from your seat, uh, how does our financial system need to prepare for these challenges? So both the Financial Stability Oversight Council and individual supervisors, for example, all of the banking supervisors have recognized that losses related to climate change um, can have an impact on banks, that this is a risk that individual banks need uh, to monitor and assess, guard against, and that supervisors also need to be able to do independent evaluations. And um, th these evaluations can be complicated and require data that are not so easily available. So the FSOC has prioritized uh, collecting and disseminating relevant data a as one of its priorities to um, work with supervisors to make sure these risks are assessed. Okay, so, and I appreciate that. So we've got, um, we've got a lot of smaller institutions, smaller banks, especially in a state like Montana, but it probably is this way all over. I mean, where, where community banks are really carrying the, the majority of, of, of the risk out there. H how do you gather that information from those folks without putting, being, being too burdensome? Well, um, we're working with the Office of Financial Research to try to produce a database, working with outside providers and pooling the resources and knowledge of the different agencies to be able to compile data that's relevant to evaluating these risks. Okay. Um, I think it's something, I agree, it would be very difficult for individual financial institutions okay, to be great. able to do. So I want to talk about cyber cybersecurity threats. Um, uh, what, what are the uh, what's what's what threats on the cybersecurity side are concern most to you right now? Well, we're definitely concerned about cyber risk to the financial sector. Um, this has been a long-standing concern. Um, it, suppliers of of software and inputs that many uh, financial institutions. Uh, use can be a source of when they um, contain uh, malware can be yep. uh, create risk to multiple financial institutions. We're working uh, carefully with a treasury that has oversight of the financial sector to quickly disseminate information. Of course, in connection with Russia and Ukraine, we're on heightened alert with respect to potential cybersecurity risks. In the cyber realm, does Congress need to do anything to empower you to deal with this issue, or do you have, do you have the capabilities to do it on your own? Well, I believe we do have capabilities working with law enforcement agencies, with CISA. Um, this is uh, largely something that private sector needs to be aware of, have the information, uh, information dissemination, is sometimes uh, imperfect, and we need to make sure that uh, when a risk is identified that firms know about it. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to get back to you with um, potential legislative needs. Uh, I think it's good. I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, it's my opinion where the next war will be fought, or a good portion of it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tester. Uh, Senator Daines, of also of Montana, is recognized. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to start by associating myself with Senator Tim Scott's remarks, as I also take issue with the characterization of abortion as a way to boost the economy. When I think about the loss of 63 million lives that have been lost to abortion in the United States over the past 50 years, I think of how many more scientists, engineers, farmers, teachers, artists, doctors that a nation could have and should have. 
And I think that look at low birth rates, coupled with an aging population, are a threat to our future economic prosperity. So I just want to state that I fervently disagree with your prior characterization. Now turning to uh, my remarks. Uh, Secretary Yellen, I believe the Treasury has done a good job ratcheting up sanctions over the past several months, but I don't believe we're moving fast enough. Ukraine has proven they're very capable of winning this war, and we must do everything we can to ensure that they not only win, but they win as soon as possible to stop the ongoing atrocities and the war crimes being committed by Vladimir Putin. Our current sanction regime is full of holes, and enforcing entities that are currently sanctioned is severely lacking. Today, online commercial registry data allows sanctioned entities to be monitored in near real time. And this data is publicly available to Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Controls. I do believe the use of real-time data needs to be stepped up in a significant manner. I also think sanctions need to be personalized to Putin. He spent decades building a massive commercial and financial network with money hidden all over the world. We need to act swiftly, deliberately, in working with the international community to pursue these illicit financial assets. I did send a letter to you yesterday, which outlines specific steps I believe should be taken in short order. Namely, I believe we should take the following actions. Here's a few. Designate Bank Rosia and all of its related entities as a primary money laundering concern under Section 311 of the Patriot Act. Second, revise the 50% rule to provide the OFAC more flexibility. And third, levy new sanctions on Gazprom, Gazprom Bank, and Rosneft. I recognize these actions come with trade-offs, but I believe a prolonged war in which war crimes that I personally witnessed myself in Bucha a few weeks ago are repeated in city after city is simply an unacceptable outcome. My question, Secretary Yellen, I know the letter was just sent yesterday, uh, if you've had a chance to read that letter, and whether Treasury would consider and would take any of these actions, and if not, why? Well, Senator, first of all, um, we, we are working very closely with our allies to remain coordinated on sanctions. We are in the process of ratcheting up sanctions, and um, periodically, almost every week, we have announced um, further steps to tighten our sanctions. So um, th we, we wish to take every action that we possibly can to raise the pain to Russia and to end this war as soon as possible. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to look at your letter. Thank you. We, I will do yeah, so. Got some, you know, My staff can get back right. to you to Thank discuss. Thank you. We've got some very specific actions I'd I, like I, to consider recommending. It's a valuable set of yeah. suggestions. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I think also we've got to continue to think about what a prolonged conflict might have on our financial stability and the world's financial stability as we see what's going on right now in terms of, of uh, energy and as well as food security. You know, Russia's occupying the port city of Kherson. In the aim to control Odessa in the last 48 hours. We've had significant attacks here on Odessa and, of course, the Black Sea. Given that Ukraine and Russia produce more than a quarter of the global wheat supply, Ukraine alone is, is 10%. They're equivalent to the United States in terms of global wheat exports. Uh, what will happen if the production and the export of, of the food supply here from that part of the world is taken offline for S years? Senator, we're terribly concerned about global food supplies. Um, the IMF World Bank meetings yeah. were here a couple of weeks ago, and I convened um, a meeting of the heads of all the multilateral development banks and um, finance ministers to discuss this issue, to come up with an action plan. We have 275 million people <coughs> globally right. who are at risk in terms of no, no um, and that, starvation. That letter I sent is meant to be helpful in trying to look at some other targeted sanctions here to continue to ratchet up the pressure here uh, so the Ukrainians can win this war. We, we, we I, share I, your goal thank here. Thank you. I want to switch to a question on, on cyber. Uh, Senator Tester brought this up to you. I believe that Treasury and FSOC are not placing enough emphasis on cybersecurity as it is a threat to our financial stability. I just spent a couple hours at Fort Meade with General Nakasone to see this firsthand in, in a classified brief. But in your testimony, you spent 158 words talking about climate-related financial risk. By comparison, you spent one word discussing cybersecurity. So do you believe that climate change poses orders of magnitude greater threats to financial stability than the threat posed by inadequate cybersecurity. So, cyber is a critical risk. 
we identify but, it but as 158 in times the report. Climate change, I, look, know, you know, yeah. climate change hasn't ever previously received attention by FSOC, and it, from a long run standpoint, over decades, it's is great or greater risk to humanity. It's certainly on a level with cybersecurity, and I think it's appropriate for us to ratchet up attention, given that it's received so little. But not trying to say that cybersecurity isn't an utterly critical risk. It is. Okay. 158 to 1 sends a pretty strong message, but thank you. Thanks, Senator Daines. Uh, Senator Warnock from Georgia is recognized. Thank you so very much, Chairman Brown, and thank you, Secretary Yellen, for testifying before the committee. Uh, as I was saying last week, one of the most effective things that the President of the United States can do to lower costs for Georgians and to help close the racial wealth gap is to cancel student debt. Uh, this would have a transformative change on young Americans across the country, freeing an entire generation from this crushing economic burden of student debt I know a little about student loans I borrowed in order to make it through college, first college graduate in my family, but it was a different time. Uh, I must admit over 30 years ago. Uh, our kids now are graduating and they have a mortgage before they have a mortgage. Secretary Yellen, the average Georgian with student debt has to pay $277 per month. Without that monthly burden, would it be easier for Georgia borrowers to save for a down payment, say, on their first home? Sure. Senator, I agree that student debt is a substantial burden to many people, um, especially those who end up with low incomes or have gone to um, colleges or for-profit uh, institutions that actually haven't, they haven't either, either not completed their degrees or um, haven't found themselves with enhanced um, skills that enable them to do well in the job market, um, yeah, and it makes it hard to buy a house. Or absolutely, and a lot of folks who are under the load of this crushing debt actually don't have a degree. Yes, uh, a lot of people don't finish their degrees, and that's a huge problem. Do you problem. think if we cancel student debt, it might encourage entrepreneurship, the starting of small businesses? Well, it would provide greater resources to do so. It'd make it easier. And collectively, are those things good for the economy or bad for the economy? Well, they, are, they could be good for the economy. There are some trade-offs involved that need to be um, analyzed. Okay. As Secretary of uh, the Treasury, if President Biden issues an executive order to cancel student debt, are you and the Treasury Department prepared to fully support the implementation of such an order? Um, you know, certainly we will support anything that President Biden decides is a pol his policy, and um, he's in the process of thinking through um, how he wishes to approach student debt. Yeah. yeah, I understand he is thinking it through, and he's talked about it publicly, and um, I just think that this is a real transformational possibility, and I hope we do it in a way that will actually make a, a real difference uh, for people's lives. I want to switch topics uh, here. Last week, I chaired a subcommittee hearing examining overdraft fees and their effects on working families. We heard testimony about the predatory practices of overdraft services offered by some banks. Uh, my office will be releasing a white paper showing the stark contrast between how banks and the American public view these fees, the way banks see it, the way their customers see it. If overdrafts have become a necessary financial safety feature, then the public should not view them as predatory or illegal, as the white paper concludes. We also heard that some banks rely on these overdraft fees to stay solvent. Imagine that, the, the bank relying on overdraft fees so that the bank can remain solvent. Do you believe that a bank that relies on exorbitant overdraft fees to make any profit is a safe and sound financial institution? Well, I would certainly hope that that is not the major source of profit for a bank that um, is serving the public. 
And certainly um, some of these fees, at least to my mind, are abusive. Yeah, I would think that of all businesses, a bank ought to be able to uh, keep a healthy balance sheet without pilfering the folks who are literally putting their money in the bank. How do you plan on working with other regulators to hold banks that use overdraft fees to stay afloat accountable? So this is not an issue that FSOC has taken up. I think it's one that's in the domain of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and also individual supervisors, but it seems to me like a natural thing for CFPB to be paying attention to. Well, some of the banks are already moving in the right direction. As Secretary of the Treasury, would you um, uh, encourage banks to follow their peers? Do you think it would be a good idea if they follow their peers and uh, uh, instead of continuing these predatory practices? Well, I think it would be a positive development if they do so. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Warnock. Uh, Senator Sinema from Arizona is recognized from her office. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing today. Secretary Yellen, thanks for joining us. Arizonans continue to be concerned about inflation and rising prices. Both parties need to work together to address supply chain bottlenecks, reduce costs for families, and fight inflation, just like we work together to pass the bipartisan infrastructure law. While I've been concerned about inflation for some time, I've also heard that recently many leading market analysts like Goldman Sachs have begun revising their inflation projections downward. Now, this is potentially an indication that economic conditions may be improving and that inflation may be cooling off. And it's promising news for Arizona families and businesses who are struggling in this current economic environment. So, Secretary, what do you think analysts are seeing in the market that's causing them to adjust their forecasts? And do you find those arguments persuasive? So um, inflation has been very high, but many analysts think that it's recently peaked and at least on a year-over-year -year basis is likely, is likely to come down. The, the Federal Reserve has begun to, I think, address inflation in a forceful way, and that's um, another factor that people see that the Fed has expressed a commitment to take the steps that are necessary to bring inflation down. And of course, the administration is focused on everything that we can do to also bring inflation down um, from steps ranging from opening up the strategic petroleum reserve to uh, respond to the pressures in energy markets from Russia's invasion of Ukraine to continuing work to address uh, supply chain bottlenecks. But, um, the, you know, the, the course of inflation remains very uncertain. Um, it, it depends in part on the pandemic, which, um, uh, you, know, can, you know, continues to affect the economy. We're seeing lockdowns in China that continue to build, build supply chain uh, pressures and problems. And, um, you know, in the United States, I think consumer spending patterns are returning to something more normal, shifting somewhat away from goods and back toward services, which should be helpful. But, um, you know, the inflation outlook still remains quite uncertain. No, thank you. You know, on Friday, we learned that the price of used cars, a traditional leading indicator of inflation, has dropped for the third consecutive month. In my mind, this means that used cars are depreciating in value again, which is another sign of economic activity returning to normal. So how do you think about this indicator, and how do these data points inform the FSOC's thinking and work when it comes to inflation? So I guess when I think about the car market, um, you know, the, the, major, the major thing I think is we had a huge run-up in the prices of both new and used cars, um, it contributed almost a third to the pickup in inflation we saw, and it partly reflected a rapid recovery in consumer demand to buy cars as the economy was recovering from the pandemic, coupled with a shortage of semiconductors 
that actually depress the ability of the industry to produce cars. And so we saw a drying up of inventories, extreme shortages, and huge pressure on the prices of new cars that spilled over to used cars as well. Dramatic pickup in prices, and uh, that's beginning to mitigate now uh, as the economy continues its recovery. So um, prices are finally beginning to come down a bit, but they remain very, very high uh, until the semiconductor situation uh, is resolved. Well, Secretary, I'm glad you mentioned the semiconductor issue because, of course, as you know, that's very important, um, not just to our nation's consumer issues, but also for national security, and it's important to Arizona's economy. My last question, as you know, I chair the Financial Innovation Caucus as the Democratic co-chair, and I'm committed to ensuring that we address systemic risk while cultivating an ecosystem that encourages responsible innovation, and especially that applies to Web3 and crypto. In February, the Financial Stability Board recommended that regulators improve coordination and information sharing to better address the cross-border and cross-sectoral nature of crypto assets. That's an important goal, and alongside that, I'd like to see greater regulatory clarity for crypto companies so that they know the rules of the road and they can build valuable products and services that help everyday people. And I want this innovation happening in the U.S. so that, so that we are creating jobs and opportunities for people. But clarity and coordination ensures that companies aren't simply built to exploit temporary regulatory gaps. So action by regulators to provide clarity to companies will provide clarity to consumers. That ensures that companies are focused on creating value and lowering costs rather than just taking advantage of regulatory loopholes or a lack of understanding or enforcement by their regulators. Now the FSOC and the regulatory entities that comprise its membership sit at the center of this dilemma. So how are these objectives being incorporated into the work going forward? So let me first say that I completely agree with the uh, discussion that you uh, just gave that there can be benefits from innovation in these areas, and we want to make sure that there is um, a solid regulatory framework in place so that firms and consumers um, understand what the rules of the road are and um, we don't end up with regulatory arbitrage that's critical also from an international perspective. And we're working certainly with our G7 colleagues and through the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, um, to make sure that our rules, to the best of our ability, are coordinated globally since these industries can, um, these firms can locate in many different, many different places. Um, the, the Financial Stability Oversight Council has been directed by the president as part of his executive order to issue a report on the risks, the financial stability risks associated with cryptocurrencies, and we're in the process of doing that. Uh, thank you, Senator Sinema. Senator thank, Ossoff, you. Th thank you. Senator Ossoff from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Yellen, for joining us. Uh, you, you noted, and FSOC has noted, cyber risk as a threat to financial stability. I'm working to protect credit unions and credit union customers in Georgia and across the country from cyber risk. I'd like you to comment on the authorities that the National Credit Union Administration lacks and, in my view, should have uh, to ensure that third-party services provided to credit unions, such as data processing, loan underwriting, Increasingly, credit unions rely upon third-party service providers in order to undertake those tasks. But there is no requirement that those credit union service providers notify the NCUA of a cyber attack, nor does the NCUA have the authority to examine those credit union service providers for cyber vulnerabilities, whereas traditional bank, commercial bank regulators do have such authorities. Do you agree that empowering NCUA, and I'm developing legislation to do this, to examine credit union service providers for cyber risk and requiring mandatory reporting of cyber incidents would help protect credit unions and their customers from cyber risk. So I'd be glad to have a detailed look at, at the legislation that you're proposing and would be glad to provide technical advice. Um, I'm not an expert in this area, but I, w I am aware that NCUA lacks some of the ability to supervise, look at servicers that 
um, the bank regulatory agencies have. And if, if I understand that properly, that certainly seems like uh, an important gap that deserves to be filled. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I'm going to ask you for your assistance identifying the appropriate official at Treasury or elsewhere in the administration uh, for designation to work with parties in Georgia on a range of issues in cons of concern to my constituents and hoping that you can briefly commit as I work through these issues to helping me identify that official a and working to connect them with the appropriate authorities in Georgia. I'm going to begin with... Ab absolutely, yes. Thank you. I, I want to begin with the Port of Savannah and the Port of Brunswick. Uh, Senator Warnock and I worked with uh, your staff in the White House and the Georgia Ports Authority last year to establish a pop-up container yard to relieve some of the congestion in the port of Savannah. At the Port of Brunswick, uh, we worked last year to uh, add a roll-on, roll-off berth. There's a lot of car shipping through the Port of Brunswick. Uh, I've just introduced legislation to uh, expand the navigation channel to expand capacity. Will you please work with my office to identify the appropriate official designated to work with the Georgia Ports Authority on an ongoing basis to relieve congestion at the port, improve shipping operations, and in so doing, address supply chain bottlenecks and, and rapidly rising costs for American consumers? Absolutely. I promise you that we will work with you on that. Thank you, Secretary Yellen. I want to uh, raise as well the challenge uh, posed by rapidly rising rents uh, and home prices. I want to focus in on, on Metro Atlanta, and I'm asking for your commitment that you'll identify the appropriate Treasury official or other administration official uh, to work with the Office of the Mayor of Atlanta, the Atlanta Regional Commission, other local, municipal, and county officials to develop a regional housing plan with the assistance and consultation of uh, the appropriate federal agencies. Will you help me with that? Certainly. I mean, it, it might be that Hood should be involved in that as well. I, I'm not sure what our division of um, responsibilities is, but be glad to connect you with the appropriate people in Treasury. Great. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to also discuss the state small business credit initiative. Uh, this, as uh, I understand it, has been um, useful for small businesses in Georgia. Uh, last year, Congress authorized an additional $10 billion to expand access to capital for small businesses through the state small business credit initiative. And Georgia expects to receive about $200 million through our Department of Community Affairs uh, to support lending to small businesses. Um, so I'm asking for a similar commitment that uh, you will work with my office to determine how we can expedite the full provision of that resource to the state of Georgia to help Georgia's small businesses. Yes, of course. We're working very hard on uh, getting the money out under that initiative and we'll work closely with you want to make sure it's successful. Thank you. With my brief remaining time, uh, just a quick macroeconomic question for you. And of course, um, in your experience previously as the Fed chair, uh, curious to get your view on the following. What economic purpose has been served and what has been the effect of continued bond buying through quantitative easing programs at the Fed uh, since last summer? I know that that's now being wound down. And I'm not asking you to comment on future Fed policy or weigh in on what the Fed should be doing. What I want to understand is what is your understanding of the purpose and the effect of continuing that bond buying through quantitative easing even as the price level has continued to rise? The, the Fed has um, ceased, ceased the bond buying under that program. The, the purpose of it, it was to ease financial conditions at a time when the economy appeared to require uh, support when it was weak. Um, by buying longer-term bonds, it tends to flatten the yield curve or push down the term premium in longer-term bonds and um, promote, um, you know, spending on housing or other, you know, other things that um, rely on long-term financing. But um, the the program has ended, and the Fed has announced that it's going to be diminishing its um, holdings over time, and that serves to tighten financial conditions. <laughs> thank you, thank Senator Ossoff. Senator Van Hollen's recognized from Maryland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Madam Secretary. Great to have you, you here. I do want to start by recognizing the, the good news in the jobs market. Um, jobs have come roaring back uh, much faster than anybody anticipated um, as a result of the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we have 
a tight labor market, and I want to associate myself with those of my colleagues who say one thing we could do right now is to reduce the cost of quality childcare uh, so that more people uh, could enter uh, the workforce. Um, my questions to you are going to focus mostly on the situation in Ukraine and the sanctions. Uh, and uh, I want to applaud you and the president uh, for the actions you took at the G7 uh, to further tighten sanctions. Of course, our, our goal is to make sure that uh, Russia feels the pain of the sanctions uh, more than others um, around the world. Uh, obviously, the war is creating all sorts of you know, economic repercussions. Uh, so we have to make sure that we target those sanctions and make it felt. Uh, here at home, we are working to close any loopholes. Um, as you know, I chair the subcommittee that um, on the Appropriations Committee that oversees the Treasury Department. And this emergency proposal we've made includes an additional $52 million uh, for FinCEN, as well as the IRS Criminal Investigations Group, uh, to go after uh, any efforts at Russian money laundering, and we need to accelerate uh, the implementation of the Corporate Transparency Act and the Anti-Money Laundering Act, and look forward to working with you on that. But I am concerned that as we're plugging these holes here at home, other countries are opening uh, doors uh, to more purchases from Russia uh, overseas. And uh, it doesn't do us a lot of good to batten down the hatches here if we're just opening up uh, escape and pressure valves uh, overseas. So I asked Secretary Blinken uh, last week whether we had used any of our secondary sanctions authority, whether the Biden administration used any secondary sanctions authority to go after countries, banks, others that uh, could be found to be evading our sanctions. Um, his answer last week was no. My understanding is to date we've not applied any secondary sanctions. Is that is that correct? Well, we make it clear when we put in place sanctions that any entity that provides material support um, to um, help a sanctioned entity um, evade those sanctions can themselves be uh, sanctioned. And I, that is something that um, we are prepared to do. And we think our willingness and ability to do so is having a very substantial impact. Um, when you look around the world, you find that financial institutions, whether they're in China or in other countries uh, that may not be terribly supportive of our views on uh, the war that Russia's waged in Ukraine, they are um, very worried about themselves being the target of sanctions for providing material help in evading sanctions. So, but Madam Secretary, um, if I could, I don't think, maybe it is, it's, I don't, is it your testimony that no financial institutions around the world are providing material support to... I'm, I'm not going to go so right. far as to right. say no. Let me, let, let me, if I could, let me, because of a limited time, I just want to read you a couple headlines, recent headlines. BBC, wealthy Russians flee to Dubai to avoid sanctions. Um, it reads, Russian billionaires and entrepreneurs have been ar arriving in the United Arab Emirates in unprecedented numbers. Property purchases in Dubai by Russians surged by 67% in the first three months of 2022. I, I have to believe that some Dubai banks that have connections to the United States banking system have been involved. Uh, here's a Financial Times um, first sentence. Uh, China's independent refiners start buying Russian oil at steep discounts. Uh, New York Times, India finds Russian oil irresistible deal despite the diplomatic pressure. You have some countries that are actually increasing the volume of their well, imports of Russia. Well, we, we haven't said that it's of, it's not a violation of our sanctions for countries to buy Russian oil. Right. So that, that is my question. I thank you for raising that. You do have it. Here's the question. I hope you would agree that we don't want countries increasing their exports of Russian oil above what they were before the war. Would you agree that that's something that is not in our interest? Well, I think... Personally, what I think is in our interest is depriving Russia of revenue from selling um, oil in global markets. And that's a somewhat different thing than saying that we wish to hold 
Russian oil off of global markets, because when we do that, we can end up driving up the price of oil globally, which counterintuitively can be um, raise Russian revenues rather than lower them. So no, I, I think I do we have appreciate to be very balance. careful about that. I appreciate that balance. Um, we are we are paying increased you know prices for oil uh, in the United States because of the global markets. Others are too. Uh, it, it seems to me we should be taking strong action against those that are sort of taking advantage and war profiteering effectively um, off of the situation. Um, we're going to pursue this. I've had conversations with Senator Toomey about secondary sanctions. It, it seems to me we have enough flashing you know, lights here indicating that sanctions are being violated, that it triggers the material support provisions, and I look forward to following up with well, you. We'd like team. to work with you on that. Thanks. This is an important issue. Thank you, Senator Van Hollen. I will now do my questions. I did not um, go on the, in the round of questions. I, uh, Secretary Yellen, uh, we know how important financial stability is as we face the global uncertainty of pandemic, supply chain disruptions, and Russia's um, attack on Ukraine. Uh, Putin's price hikes causing pain at the pump and market distortions in our country. What are the long-term financial stability impacts of those Russia's illegal actions? Well, they certainly are causing pain in the United States and around the globe. And um, we're, we're very worried. The IMF issued um, a recent report showing there's a diminished prospects for global growth and higher inflation. We're likely to see and are seeing tighter monetary policy all around the world. So we're in a, an environment of rising of high inflation and rising interest rates. Um, a global downturn uh, would have many repercussions on the United States, um, which um, could impact the well-being of um, and earnings of financial institutions, including American banks, and in, a, in, interest, in a, an environment of rising interest rates with high inflation, um, there, there certainly are risks to um, banks and to borrowers who are indebted. Our financial stability report looks at some of those risks. Generally, although debt burdens of companies are high, debt service ratios are not very high, which suggests um, good, good prospects there. Um, supervisors regularly evaluate banks with respect to interest rate risks. As interest rates rise, that tends to diminish the value of um, assets that they hold on their portfolio, but it has the contrary effect of tending to raise net interest margins. But there certainly are, um, in parts of the financial system where there may be leverage, the, financial, the Federal Reserve issued its financial stability report just yesterday and noted uh, insurance companies and some hedge funds as leveraged entities that could, could be vulnerable in a rising interest rate um, environment. Thank you, Ty. As you talk about the Fed's role in, in fighting an inflation caused by uh, the, the, the Russia, Russia's war, as inflation caused by uh, the pandemic, caused by uh, uh, supply chain interruptions uh, and distortions, and as interest rates rise and risk could bubble up on Wall Street. Walk through why it's important for financial firms to have sufficient capital, liquidity, and other safeguards to protect against economic shock from those risks. It's critically important, and I think we have Dodd-Frank to thank for the fact that um, banks have adequate capital and liquidity and um, certainly look from the Fed stress tests like um, they would be able to fare very well in a stressful environment and did very well um, when the pandemic struck in March of 2020. And I, and I know you recognize that banks did well through this pandemic. A number of banks did stock buybacks. Executive compensation was stratospheric. 
Um, but I'm also concerned, as I know you are, from comments in the past about risks in the shadow banking system. So those remain, and we're, we're they're high on our agenda to address, but they've not yet been addressed. Money market funds, uh, maybe hedge funds, open open end mutual funds. And thank you. My last question: You've warned a number of times that the last thing we need is for risky new financial products to crash our financial system. Stable coin companies claim that they're backed by supposedly safe assets, but they've proven to be wildly volatile. Just look what happened yesterday in the markets, rife with speculation and fraud, no recourse for consumers who've been the victim of scams. Why is it critical for FSOC, uh, member, the, 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 the agencies, the member agencies of FSOC, which you chair, why is it critical for them to be united on a strong regulatory structure for stable coins? Well, I think it's important for us to agree on what kind of structure is needed um, to ensure that these are introduced in a safe and sound fashion and don't create financial stability risks. And our um, strong recommendation to Congress is that um, you work on a bipartisan basis to put in place a comprehensive national regulatory framework, and we would be I'm glad to work with you on such an initiative. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. As is the custom, uh, the ranking member uh, will do his close, and I understand he's going to yield to Senator Scott, and then I will do my close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I will yield to Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Secretary Yellen, for investing your time with us, and certainly a, a, a hard uh, banking hearing for, for many. And uh, I know that Senator Cortez Masto so why should I impose my circumstances on others? Well, uh, I think because my circumstances is so much like so many others, millions and millions of kids being raised in poverty by single parent households who happen to be black, telling black teenage moms that there's only one alternative for them is a depressing and challenging message. So sitting through and listening to so many folks stereotype the necessity of making a life-altering decision as if it's the option, to me is not right. And I understand that this issue, the issue of abortion is a difficult issue, but let's remember that the rate of abortion for teenage moms is at the lowest we've seen ever. The New York Times says it's under 10%. And so what I'm talking about is the importance of understanding the reality that even during tough financial times in households like the one I was raised, there is still hope. There's hope because we've seen the consequences of good policies, and unfortunately, we've had to experience the consequences of bad policies. You're talking about the challenges in many of the minority communities around this country. We've seen in the last couple of years a 44% increase in homicides around this nation. 85% of that increase have been African Americans and Hispanics being killed. That impacts the labor force participation rate without any question. And it does so, neg so negatively. I think about the, the reasons why we should be hopeful and, and send a message of optimism and opportunity to single moms around this country challenged with too much month at the end of the money. It's the policies where Senator Cortez Masto talked about the tax reform. Well, the tax reform of 2017 cut a single mom's taxes by 70% on the federal level, led to $4,000 more in the average pocket of the average household in this nation. We created 7 million jobs, two-thirds of those jobs going to African Americans, Hispanics, and women. These are facts. It's a 50-year low in unemployment. So the labor force participation rate at that time was going up, not down. And because of the increase in the labor force participation rate, you don't always expect that the unemployment rates will continue to drop. But they did. They dropped significantly. We saw the lowest unemployment rate for African Americans in this country, under 6% for the first time. Hispanics under 5% for the first time, I, I believe. Asians under 3%. We, we, we saw a 70-year low for women. In 2019, we saw the lowest rate 
recorded in our nation's history, is my understanding, for poverty. And so what I'm suggesting is that, yes, people on the left and people on the right can work together to bring about positive policy changes that can transform the lives of those living in poverty. It's one of the reasons why I th I'm thankful for Senator Warner and Senator Van Hollen and Senator Booker working in a bipartisan fashion on opportunity zones. This is an opportunity for us to, to weigh the impact in some of the most devastated zip codes in America where private sector has increased wages, reduced unemployment, reduced poverty, and increased property values without gentrifying those neighborhoods. So when we're going to have a conversation about those issues that improves the economic reality of those living in poverty, when we're going to have a conversation about improving the outcome of this nation's poorest Americans, I think we should have that conversation. I am frankly willing to have the debate with anyone, anywhere, at any time on my lived experience versus anyone else's because I believe that America is the solution, not the problem. I believe that we can work both left and right together to find those solutions and not only debate them, but try them in the public forum. And when we do so, I believe America is better. Not when we demonize one side or the other side. I, I, I refuse to have a, a conversation about wrong on one side and right on the other side. I'm simply saying that the experience of so many of us, millions of us in poverty, I conclude is a reason to be hopeful about what's possible, even for those incredibly powerful, positive women making really hard choices. Thanks, Senator Scott and Senator Toomey. I, I heard no stereotype uh, from Senator Cortez Masta on her comments. I, I appreciate Secretary Yellen, Senator Cortez Masto noting that women should have the right to decide when to have children. I, I did hear revisionist history again about the Trump tax cut, which okay. blew a hole in the deficit, uh, which blew a hole in the deficit, and and which um, which clearly helped seventy percent of them went to the richest one percent. I also heard talk of the lowest poverty rates. The lowest poverty rates came when um, the, when we passed the child tax credit, the fully refundable child tax credit, which dropped poverty rates among children by forty percent. Senator Scott voted against it twice. Uh, and a year, about a year ago, 14 months ago, and joined by every single Republican, every Democrat passed it. When I hear, I, I, we know what this is all about. It's, it's Senator, I'll um, not make it about Senator Scott, it's Senator McConnell just wants to distract from the real issue, and that's if Roe is overturned, every American woman's going to have her freedom and make her own personal health decisions taken away and handed over to politicians. And it shouldn't be handed over to me, it shouldn't be handed over to, to to Secretary Yellen, it shouldn't be handed over to Mitch McConnell. And like Senator Cortez Masto, I'm opposed to taking the, having the government take away women's freedom to make those own personal health care decisions. Uh, thank you, Secretary Yellen, for joining us. For senators who wish to submit questions for the record, they're due one week from today, Tuesday, May 17th. Secretary Yellen, please submit your response within 45 days from the day you receive them. The committee's adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>